Dr. Anson be, been around and he's been very, very heavily engaged in transportation uh, infrastructure activities. He's a professor now at uh, IUP. He is also the director of uh, uh, ALS Research and Training Center. He has been uh, very closely engaged with the uh, Federal Highway Administration, EPA, doing research at, uh, on technology transfer. He also worked at Penn State and uh, University of New Hampshire, where he actually received his PhD from, and he worked as a director uh, for uh, in establishing the research and also um, uh, identifying the processes, procedures, uh, and analytical procedures for tr technology transfer. This has come up many times today. The gaps in technology transfer uh, can cause so much ha havoc, hazards, and I think this is a, r I'm, I'm glad we chose this topic, and this fits right into that particular comment that if there are gaps in technology transfer, what can happen? So uh, his topic is navigating the transition from research to practice. Please welcome Dr. John Anderson. Thank you. All right. The high tech part, how do I move it forward? Yeah. This one forward, this one back? OK. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to do my best to hang right on because I'm just before food. Okay, I know that that's important, but that's better than being after food because it keeps everyone's awake. So that's a good thing. Um, otherwise, you'll look like my students. There we go. I thought, oh, I can jump into the future, but I might want to jump all the way back into the past. And I want to start there because we can learn a lot from the past. We had a, a, an act that came in there. That was a big one. And then we have this funny little thing happened. And by the way, the, that Highway Act was not to land bombers on our highways. Uh, it was actually to move people around. But Eisenhower was concerned about nuclear war and wanted to evacuate. But it really was economic and moving people. Sputnik, that's what that is. And that's what came out. And it created a lot of fear. And f and we really work together on kind of motivated by fear more so than competition. And I like competition, but sometimes it gets in the way and cooperation is, is a, it comes out of fear many times. We have a common enemy, we're gonna to get together, we're gonna to do things. But also cooperation can get in the way. So what we wanna do is we wanna realize that there's a tension between those two and we wanna be able to operate both those things and, and, and manage them. So it really comes, it's going to come into a, and I've heard this over and over again, people. People. It's going to come into people. So I want to bring up a couple things. ARPA was the Advanced uh, Research uh, Programs, uh, um, Research Projects uh, Agency out of the DOD. This is, this is where we, we started, in a sense. That came in because of Sputnik. Then we have... ARPANET. And ARPANET is where we got the TCP IP and things like that. And I got some heads shaking because there's some gray hair out there like me. And ARPANET comes in, and that's actually the precursor into our internet, into a lot of things that we're seeing. And by the way, that's before Al Gore came in. All right? And that was out of a, a um, <clears throat> response for comments, <clears throat> kind of a publication. And the internet came in, and it was internetworking. It was short for internetworking. Al Gore did push this uh, information superhighway, and I like the fact that we started with highway, and we're ending up here with highway, and the concept of it, and IoT. So that's kind of a, a picture of where we've been, where we are, and how we got here. But I want to give some context for today and some context in, in going back a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. The national, under the umbrella of the National Academy of Sciences, a bunch of folks, Federal Highway, and other people got together. And there were, there were, there were different agencies. There were folks from different universities, et cetera, coming together saying, hey, and it was at Woods Hole, which was a great place because we all ate lobster. And 
here we, here we were there and working there, and there was a problem. There's a problem of how do we move research from, you know, from research into practice. And although some of it flies, as we saw this morning, and we saw that curve jumping up there, some of it's going very slowly. And really part, it kind of depends on your picture of speed. And I'll give you some examples as we move on, that some things that we think are very, very fast are actually uh, uh, being put together in, in a way because they're not fast enough, all right? So we have a lot of issues. So the whole thing was how do we do it and how do we do it better? And is it possible to improve that process of, of moving things? And I'm gonna bring it up again. A lot of times maybe the problem is people. And you get the one, my job would be great if it wasn't for the people. My, my, my job would be great if it wasn't for the students. It'd be a lot easier, you know? So sometimes it's people, and we've heard that a lot this morning. There were a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions, and very few answers that came out of this activity. One of them that we want to look at is how do elements of the research of technology, T2 being technology transfer, Elements of practice, of outcomes, of implementation. How do, what are they and how do they all interact? And I know it's cliche, but the objective was moving from state of the art to state of the practice. And I hate using the cliches, but you know what I'm saying when I do it. Key ideas. There's an iterative spiral of research that exists. And I'm going to, I want to be able to present that to you so you get a feel for what's going on, what, I, what we mean by that. And where you stand in that spiral, in that process, depends on what you see. And the people you work with and the markets you deal with vary depending on where, what point are you in that process. And this is my little picture of it. You like the little bright idea guy spinning around there? What we're doing is we're starting at this top and we get with the, with the bright idea and it moves down through this spiral and we get this basic research world. And basic research is kind of that la la land in, in high level research uh, that we see. And then and there's, you can see there's testing and implementation going on there. And Deepak, I loved what you did because you're gonna be, your, yours is a beautiful example of this whole process because he started off up in this area, then he moves in and he's doing that, and then he coming in, we just heard, and he's doing this applied research area, and we've got testing and implementation going there, and then we also have, oh, this is good, coming down here, testing implementation, then practice and deployment, and yet you can see though that there's all these different loops of feedback as things are, are going around, and this is the spiral coming down. This is a life cycle. I want to give you a couple of ideas, and it's interesting. The first one was sort of a, just a, 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 an interesting thought. When I was a little kid, down in my grandpa's workshop, I mean, he was an electrical engineer. He worked for a very large company, traveled around the world doing a lot of things, and we were down there building paddle boats with rubber bands is what we were doing. And he said, hey, check this out. And he had this, this cylinder, about three quarters of an inch in thickness and glass. And it was like half of a circle. And he said, watch this. I can bend light. And he put it up to the light bulb, and it shot the light right over to the side. And I went, oh, that's cool. Grab it. That's really neat. But what good is it? He goes, I don't know, but it's going to be worth an absolute fortune someday. That's an idea. That's where we just don't know where they're going to come from and how they're going to come from. This is a story, like... You've, you know, the rest of the story. This is a story about a fella who has a, a little kid who is hydrocephalic. He was in Pennsylvania. He was in Philadelphia. That's water on the brain. And what happened was he was a machinist. And he goes and he talks to the doctors. He finds out what's happening. For years, they've been trying to, to deal with hydrocephalic children. And he says, my gosh, you just need a valve here, one that's going to work in a certain way. He went back to his garage and three weeks later, this guy was motivated. Three weeks later, he had the valve. It was out of a material he couldn't get. 
So he get, instead, he finally gets silicone and gets someone to create it. And unfortunately, it was a week late for his child. And they had to put the old, which never worked, type valve into the child, and, and he lost his child. However, he continued to work on this thing. And we now have millions of kids being saved because we put together neurosurgeon and a machinist, different ways of thinking. House flies, they have antennae. And they can pick out explosives. And they can pick them out really, really well. And they can, in fact, when they pick out the explosives, they don't get any false positives. And we are blowing up people all over the place. We're very good at that. And we're blowing them up, and we need to, to get a hold of that because we're blowing up children, and we need to get on the booby traps that are left over and the landmines and other sorts of things. And people are trying to do that. Plus, if we're in a situation, we want our people to avoid them as well. But we have false positives and everything. It's sitting right now in absolute research stage. Why? Because they need engineers at this point to be able to move that concept, the research that they did, which was at a basic research level, and they want to be able to move that forward. Okay? But they need engineering to do it. This was an interesting one that happened in the past. This is a fellow who is really all about Mendelbrot. Everyone's heard of old Mendelbrot. He's the fractal guy. Um, and he was working with IBM. And they were trying to get signals across the phone lines. And they were increasing the signal strength. Increase, increase, increase. And they were always having an error. He comes in, he talks with them a little bit, and he is able to model, statistically model, exactly what was going on with all the errors. And what that did was it said, no, we can't think increasing signal strength. We need to think, how do we redundancy? Getting it there, sending it back, knowing that it goes through. We need to change our way of thinking. And that's what he did. He changed the way of thinking. But the way he did it is he went back to the 1800s and pulled basic research out of mathematics. And Cantor was an 1800 mathematician. So that it's, it's, in fact, if you ever get a chance to watch Hidden Figures, it's an awesome movie. It's, a, it's about the space program. And that's exactly what we did when we put, put a person into space. We went back to an 1800s type of mathematics that, that was buried, but somebody knew it, and they were able to bring it forward and solve the problem. Here's one interesting one about sediment buildup. This is about a hydrologist colleague of mine, and he's at a picnic, and, and he's talking with somebody, and all of a sudden, he's gone. And they're back at his office looking at stuff because he's got pictures of streams and sediment buildup, et cetera. And guess who he's talking to? Somebody who has no idea about this but is extremely interested is a cardiologist. And it built a relationship and they continued to work because they had more knowledge of sediment buildup and the cardiologist wanted to understand that sediment buildup in the human body. And they were able to take his hydrology information and, and, and tie it in with the medicine. Are you hearing what's happening? We're getting people with different backgrounds, multidisciplinary approaches, because we cannot make a discovery unless we have the prerequisite knowledge to do it. And if we're not talking to people in other fields, we're not going to get it. And that's why I love what I'm doing. It's administration and leadership studies. It's not ALS like a, a disease. And that program is really, really, that's my little plug. It's a very exciting program because it's multidisciplinary. I got military people, I got people in, in human services, I got biologists, zoologists, chemists, um, I've got engineers, I've got transportation people, I got medical people, all together working because the biggest issue that they're finding is as they drive things forward in their fields is people. Transporting light. 3M is a great company that for, for product development. And they created this really, really awesome plastic. If you ran your fingers across, it'd be like corduroy, if you will. You could feel it go Really what it is, is, is it's just prisms that run down this plastic. And you probably haven't necessarily seen it. Maybe some of you have. But they, they killed it because they couldn't market it. They're awesome at product development. They're not as good at marketing. But it, it, the neat thing is, is it took and tr transported light. So they built a prototype of a street lamp. 
and they could put the light down here. You don't need a big bucket to get up there to change those light bulbs. You can change the light bulb right down here. And it did not lose any of the light coming out. They just carried it up and over. They put lights on buildings, etc. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, why can't you run lights through tunnels? Why can't you? But they weren't really into the marketing. I would love to have gone into the hardware store, getting a big tube that had that stuff in there, put it in my basement and run one light or two lights and run my whole basement, all the lighting that I wanted, because it would create this beautiful diffused light, which was great for office buildings as well. I work with some folks at, um, in, in, and this is what's kind of interesting. I did spend about 26 years working civil engineering, but I'm a sociologist, okay? That's kind of weird. But I'm an applied statistician. And I worked with some folks that in, in New Hampshire that were working on pollution. And they, they follow the, the, the plumes through the, 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 wa you know, the water plumes that coming in there, the groundwater. They're following it by counting bugs. Because some of the pollution increases bugs, and some of the pollution decreases bugs. So they're counting the bugs. And they have so much data, they didn't really know what to do with it. And I said, hey, have you ever thought about simplifying the data in principal components? They said, we haven't used principal components analysis. And if you have, that's great. And if you haven't, that's OK, too. But what they did was they were able to simplify the data. But the cool thing about it, this is a, a, an engineering professor who now has all of her master's students go take a statistics course over in sociology. Because they never had looked at some of the things. Why? Because they worked and were grown, brought up thinking, I can go to the lab and I can tweak it. And I can control it. And I can test it. I can do something in the lab. But when you're out in the field, you can't. And the sociologist has no control over anything. And so we've learned how to use statistical control. And so we learned how to simplify lots of data. And that was something they said, well, I said to her, I said, well, how, what did this do for you? Nancy Kinner. And what did this do for you? She goes, well, it, it pushed us about four years down the road. About four years down the road. I've got all these little stories. There's a whole piece about biological weapons. They were concerned. I ran it. I've done so many crazy things in my life, and I ended up working with some people who were doing that. And dealing with it, and they were saying, what happens if it goes off? How do we go? How do we do it? How do we follow it? Where is it going to happen? I said, you're just talking to the wrong people. That's already mapped out. Talk to the transportation folks. Talk to the transportation folks. They know who's moving, where the trips are happening, where they're coming from, because that's how the biology is going to be moving. In all of these cases, we're poking people from different fields and plugging them together. Ah, and then, of course, here we are. Autonomous vehicles. You wanted to know how I was going to get there. I'm going to get there. I want this one right here. I want you guys to build me that one because that's the one I want in my garage. I think it's awesome. And I also was really, really saying, wow, 1956. That's, the, that's when the highways are coming out. And here we are. And there's not much difference there, except we dropped the kids off, you know? Right? Right? You know? Yeah, we dropped the kids. And, and they didn't realize it was going to be awful hot in there. So I hope they have a good air conditioning system and they have sunglasses. But this is a very, very interesting concept of the, what's going on. Social and social psychological challenges exist along the way in all research, all research. Here's the challenge, the challenge of connecting, networking. I thought, isn't it great? We want to have these type of conferences going on. We want to invite people. We need to have some people here who are from other fields other than engineers. If I said, how many of you are engineers? I'd get a pretty good, how many of you are engineers? All right, how many of you went to school? I'll get a lot of hands up now. OK, so we need to have other people coming in as well. And that's what I like about this, this uh, organization that has recently been created. But I want to look at this, the chance meeting. We have put most of our things together by chance meetings. My friend was at a picnic, took off, and it was a chance meeting. He didn't know that doctor was going to be there. I've had a lot of chance meetings at conferences. I didn't know that person was going to be there. They didn't know I was going to be there. We have to automate, in a sense, our chance. V to V, we need me to you, you know, you to me. That's what we need. We need that going on. We have so many people things happening. 
we have a language problem. We have hard versus soft sciences. And a lot of people don't want to talk to the social scientists, but you know all of the, the paradigms that they're operating in. In fact, the whole concept of a paradigm shift came from a physicist. And all of the, the breakthroughs and the methods that are being used there was from physics. They used it. And the physicist said, why aren't we using it in physics? Research and evaluation, and I'm going to talk about that one a little bit more. But that's a difference and a difference of language. Engineering versus marketing. Big difference. That's part of that 3M issue. You got to be able to think it. Marketing talks very differently than engineering. And they don't like each other necessarily because the marketing will sell to somebody. It's more than just selling, by the way. The salesperson says, hey, the tractor will jump over the barn. And the engineer's going, no, it won't, it won't. He goes, shush, I'm selling it, I'm selling it. It's a totally different language. And there are a lot of other languages. Any discipline that you come up with is going to be a language. And there's dialects. I did work in the, in the Department of Transportation. It's a great department. And, and yet, when I was doing it, I was investigating. Guess what? Other people didn't know what other people were doing. In fact, I'd get small groups together, and they would argue what they were doing themselves in their own functional area. But they certainly didn't know what other functional areas were doing. And that's in a pretty tight operating of, of organization. So that's what I mean by dialects, even within our own fields. And that creates silos. And I've it said, hey, it's been mentioned, silos. Some people have called it stovepipes, but silos are full of really good stuff, even though it's fermenting, which maybe, maybe, maybe it's better that way. But it's really good stuff inside of a silo. So I like to call it a silo, because there's good stuff in there. But there's also, what did we hear today? We're fighting for budgets, screaming for budgets. I want money, you want money, they want money. Who wants money? Okay, a lot of hands are going to go up, right? And that creates fiefdoms and challenges. And this is when sometimes, sometimes cooperation might do a little bit better in advancing things than some of the competition, particularly when we have competition of fiefdom building with inside key organizations. And you know what happens in a silo? We get comfortable. And this is the challenge of knowing. I want to live there. This is, a challenge. this is out in Nebraska, I'm sure. Well, at least in Iowa. So we get comfortable there. We get comfortable in what we know. Where do we find our knowledge? The knowledge that we have. Who we know. How we know. This is how we do it. This is what we do. This is why we had, oh, it's the signal strength. No, it's not just the signal strength. There's something else going on. You can get that on the internet, is it, right? I want to read something from Mendelbrot. Don't usually sit and read, but I'm going to absolutely read it. Science would be ruined if, like sports, it were to put competition above everything else, and if it were to clarify the rules of competition by withdrawing entirely into silos, narrowly defined specialties. The rare scholars who are in nomads by choice, and I'm going to suggest we create nomads by assignment, nomads by choice are essential to the intellectual welfare of settled disciplines. That's a very interesting comment. Now, the mathematician, he was a great mathematician, but people, the math would say, who is he? I don't know, but he's not one of us. But he was a real interesting character, and he solved a lot of issues. Research and evaluation, I just want to say there's a big difference between them. Particularly, evaluation involves value, and research doesn't necessarily do that. Research is, is looking at a focus into knowledge bases, is building knowledge bases, versus working and building uh, issues for stakeholders. There's just a whole big difference, and there's a, just a lot of, I've got a researcher or my evaluator is a change agent versus my researcher as an investigator. Um, and by the way, if there are values and in politics involved, there's winners and losers. So evaluation has got something that's a little bit different. And the cool thing about evaluation is it's got a very different structure. It's much larger. And I talked to a friend of mine, and I said, OK, what's going on with it 
it, when, when I look at, um, uh, uh, I was talking to him, he was a very much a part of the epoxy-coated rebar thing, building epoxy-coated rebar and, and when, when that all came about because our bridges were falling apart and said, okay, let me tell you how I think this went down. And I told him, because he, he was right in the projects. He was doing the work and, he's, and he had been a part of it. And I said, you, you had this thing and you said, you know what, we know that rust cause, you know, expands, it breaks and, and, and our bridges are breaking, we need to do something about it. Okay, fine. Then that's our, that's our theoretical perspective. Because the question is, where's my failure? Is it a theoretical failure? Is it a program failure? Is it an implementation failure? And these different sets of hypotheses deal with the impact. And that's why I liked what Deepak was doing. He was following right down here. He was taking an evaluation perspective. He was sitting down in this area at this point saying, hey, is what we're doing what we expected? Are we really doing what we plan to be doing? And I said, the epoxy coated rebar did that. And they sent it out, and our bridges got worse. So they, well, the first thing they did was they were thinking, research, research. They bring it right back into the lab. Now, they could have had a different program. They could have used fiber, uh, you know, carbon fibers and stuff, but they're very brittle. The tensile strength isn't so good, so this, it, rebar's got better properties. But what they did instead was they, they went back to the um, uh, applied science area and into the laboratory, and they did make it a little bit more pliable. But they came back out, and it was still a problem. And what they ended up finding was what you would take and lift up that rebar and carry it over in a forklift and drop it down. And they weren't exactly treating it nicely. They were treating it like the regular rebar. And somebody observed this and said, oh my gosh, we're wrecking the coating. We need to train people how to do it right. And I think training is going to be something that's going to ha be absolutely essential in the world of autonomous vehicles. Evaluation, which is a bigger picture than research. And by the way, my friend said, how the heck did you know that? I said, because I put on an evaluation hat, not a research hat. So it said, notice that it follows the research life cycle. Basic research is happening here. My applied research is happening here. And my implementation or actually my deployment activities are happening here. And we can have a failure at any point. And we need to be investigating every point, And we need to be thinking about every point. I want to roll this thing out. I want to roll it right off of the silo and just take a look at what's happening inside. When I take a look at what's happening inside, I'm going to look at th this basic research coming over here, applied research, practice deployment. What happens is I got a process that creates some type of knowledge. In this case, it's theoretical knowledge. In terms of valid results, construct validity, I don't know if that means anything to most people, but some people it does. It means that I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in what, I'm, what I believe is true is true. Over here, I get a prototype, and it's got to be marketable. And over here, I have adopted and use, and I'm very interested in both utility and reliability. But the interesting thing is that we have these gaps in the middle, here and here. And that's where we put in technology transfer. You need to be able to talk back and forth. Mendel brought, reached up here, pulled things, and brought them down here. Semiconductor business puts, has a big group, a corporation, that builds, does all of the basic research for, researches, research for semiconductors. Can't say that 10 times fast. And they're doing it for the government, the US government defense, and they're doing it for the industry. And then the industry is working down here. But they cannot stay ahead. They can't push it fast enough. And we think about that as being a fast world. It's not fast enough. And so what they did was they built this corporation to operate here, which has virtual connectivities with Starnet. And, and people are, are, are working. A lot of it originally started at Georgia Tech. This is the picture, and this is what we need. This is where I'm saying, let's plant people. 
and that little dot in the middle, that's because this is three-dimensional. This is one silo, but we have other silos, and we need to be talking to other silos. This is just human factor stuff, because I was told there's a bunch of engineers here, so I said, well, let me grab human factor stuff, because maybe it'd be alien. My thing is that the language is different, and if you're going to do technology transfer, you need to understand the language. The problem is you don't know what you don't know, and I don't know what you know, and I don't know what I don't know. Huh? I know. Isn't that something, something pretty, pretty crazy, kind of flipping around? But it's true, and that's why training's darn important, right? So I don't know what I don't know. Let's talk about just a couple of these things from examples from language. Passive fatigue. I like this one. Cognitive load. When was the last time you did research on cognitive load? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But do you know that you know, the, the whole theory comes out of educational psychology? Are you involved in educational psychology? What, they, what are the educational psychologists doing? How have they advanced it along? Have we reached in to get their ideas so that we don't have to mess around with it? It's a, these are serious, top of the line, human factors issues for AV. Situational awareness, I heard that already. This is a language issue. You gotta let me read this one to you, okay? The perception of the elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status in the near future. They could have said that simpler. But it's the way other people talk in other fields. Are you talking that way? Can you hear what they're having to say? Motion sickness. I thought this would be important to have just before we eat. All right? So motion sickness. I like this. The conflict between visual and vestibular inputs. You know, and the loss of control. Well, when AVs, I don't know where I'm going because the automation is taking me there, and we have a lot of chance of higher increases of motion sickness. That's going to be a hard time of, of adoption, of, of adopting the uh, technology if, if people are having that problem. This comes from aviation. This is a serious point. Mode confusion. We happen to have... And I, I, I do like the discrepancy between a person's understanding and reality sounds like some of my relatives, OK? We happen to have some information that we found out that the pilots are being confused by automation. Now, pilots are above average intelligence. Now, I just want to share that with you because by definition, half of the population is below average intelligence, OK? So as, the, as we create these very you know, in, intense automated systems, we need to be able to know how we're going to be working with them. And one of the things is the Air Flight, uh, I should say uh, Air France, Flight 447, is in a, uh, was an a Airbus. Now Airbus is different than Boeing. Boeing, you get a feedback of the of pilot controls. Airbus, you don't. Boeing, the pilot can override the protective automation. Airbus, you don't. So what happens is they've got a, a freeze going on in the pitot. The pitot are these tubes are, are telling the airspeed. And so as the plane is increasing, all right, the speed is actually the same, but it says that the speed is, that is decreasing. And when it's decreasing, it says it's I think it's just, uh, just the opposite. It doesn't matter. It was not right, okay? And when, when, so as it was going up, as a saying that we're de we're, we're, the acceleration is going down, the airspeed is going down, and so we're going down and saying the airspeed is going up or whatever. It's backwards, and they don't have any feedback between the pilots. So what they did was the one pilot's making con changes here, another pilot, co-pilot's making changes here. They're putting things in. They can't see what it is. The feedback's not coming, and they put it into a stall, and it was not recoverable and they lost it. And that was in 2009, that's not that far, that, that, that long ago. They call this mode confusion, when I don't know, when I'm coming out of that automation and I don't know what's going on. There's a whole bunch of others, a bunch of others, and I'm not gonna go into every single one of them, I got little stories on it, but I'm not gonna go into all of them. Uh, I do wanna say that this one's interesting, S this one right here, skill uh, degradation. Brief periods of high automation impairs manual driving skills. The big red button. The big red button is the, I'm going to give this over to my, my five foot two Marine here. She's pretty, she's pretty, only five foot two Marine I've ever met. 
And I'm gonna, we're going to turn that automation over, but we're no longer looking at reaction time, folks. We're looking at re-engagement time. Five to seven seconds. So if we're thinking, we're just going to turn this over. But now let's just think, I'm going to turn it over. It's OK. And we're going to exit off the ramp, All right? whatever that might be. Let's add 30 to 40 seconds. That's not total. So now I've got 35 to 47 seconds. By the time I, I, by the time I really stabilize my vehicle and I'm, I'm totally oriented back into it after a period of automation, this is a problem that needs to be dealt with and worked with. There are human factor issues that are critical that are going to come in and they're going to give it a bad name. And I just want to let you know, I think we can do this. I think AV is going to happen. And I think it's going to be awesome. I really, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great because I had to take care of my mom for a long time. It would have been great to put, I had to do a driving Miss Daisy thing, you know, with her. Instead, I wanted to put her right into, she can't yell at me, she's gone now. But I wanted to put her in one of them vehicles and send her off to the grocery store. It would have been great because she had macular degeneration. Or as one of my doctor friends said, wow, I had someone came in. They told me they had a macular degeneration. It was like, wow. <laughs> it was like, whoa, well, that's interesting. Um, these are the things that I would suggest that we take a quick look at very quickly. Identify who should be involved in every single phase of the research. Think of that research. I gave you an overview, but it's just think of the research life cycle. Every phase of the life cycle, who should be there? And who do you know can speak the different languages? Obviously, set an evaluation plan. Obviously, monitor, intervene. That were, those were those points I was pointing at. Intervening, horizontal, vertical, transfer. Speaking the language, moving it around, moving it through the people. Not just the same old, same old folks that we talk to, but people we don't necessarily know. I like this one. Your organization should be bigger than your organization. You'd be partnering, you'd be cooperating, you'd be talking with other people. This is this being agile, et cetera. Should be, your organization needs to be bigger than your organization. You need to reach out and notice all of those inventions I told you about. The, the prerequisite knowledge came from another discipline. Nomads by choice, nomads by assignment is what I say. Put them in there, get them in there, those people who can speak the languages, who can talk, and it can move it forward.